All right, here we go. One for the road and one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. Is that how it goes? I yeah. never knew. According to Bugs I thought Bunny. it was three to get arrested or something. I'm pretty sure that was a parody. Or some kind of joke version. Don't think that Isn't was that officially... I think it was from a song or something like that. It's like some kind of 50s song. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that Bugs Bunny said it. Yeah, and if exactly. Bugs Bunny said it, then that's good enough for me. One for the money, two for the show, three to get arrested, and four to blow. <laughs> Bugs Bunny did not say that. <laughs> okay. Three? I think that was Elvis. Never mind. Elvis. <laughs> yeah, I think it was Elvis who originally said that. Oh, it could have been in some song. Y'all are impairing our host. It's not me. Yeah. I would, you started it. You said one for the money, two for the show, for the get ready for to go. Yes, because I was... And then we didn't even go. And then James turned it into a thing about drugs. And now here we that are. Was, that wasn't me. What... I... What saying... Saying to blow means to... Means cocaine, necessarily? I do cocaine! Okay, it was either drugs or sex. What do you want from me, James? <laughs> Okay, he turned it into a thing about blowing bubbles. Okay, there we go. There we go. Just blew another one right there. There we go. There can be only one. They're here. I have come here to chew bubble gum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubble gum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, welcome to Cinema Royale. This is is Mike Mixtape hosting this particular episode. Of course, nobody else is hosting, because I always host. Unless anybody else out there wants to host this, I give them a chance. Uh, let's get off with uh, introducing to my film officiados of the night. Uh, just a heads up, Morgan's not with us tonight. He's got some personal obligations he has to attend to. He'll come back whenever he uh, feels like it. Needs a paycheck. <laughs> I know... <laughs> Sure, I'll just give you He's all of paying you? What? Well, not in money, but... <laughs> not oh, in okay. money. <laughs> not in money. Okay. What else could you pay in checks? I'm gonna write out $2,000 in gummy Monop bears. <laughs> in Monopoly money. PayPal! Oh, yeah, you can do PayPal. I don't know what was in your contract. I don't pay attention to these details. <laughs> I just looked at the contract. I got my contract right here. Happened. If you look at section C, <laughs> you can't even tell jokes. You look at yourself. Look There's at yourself, no Mike. contract. He can't even focus. What the this heck did I sign to come in here? The... Oh, I forgot to enter my tin number into the appropriate box. Thank you for yeah, waiting to, to this. I can't believe I own your soul. Whoops, I said too much. Thanks a lot. What? I First. just signed that contract. First up, we've got the ever-loving Canadian girl known as oh. Jada Jada. Hey, folks. <laughs> you know, when I'm chillaxing through a hot summer day reading over my contracts, owning the soul of my podcast host. You know what I like to do to refresh myself? Drink a big can of Coors Light. Who wants a cold one? I'm just kidding. Coors sucks. Is Don't ever a, drink. Is that is a is that, is that basically water? No. People pee in it, and then <laughs> they sell it. It's more than just water. Don't insult them. Well, that's what I don't beer know. I essentially know my is. Just that's saying, why I don't I drink it. Beer, so, like, I don't know. Coors Sandwich. Light, meh. Coors Light like is what all beer tastes, tastes like to people who don't like beer. The man in the middle, in between uh, this Canadian sandwich we have going on here, is James Sullivan, also known as Homitude. Dude, nice broadcast. 
Sorry. Two Looted Nights broadcast is brought to you by arguably sexist Disney employee manuals from 1943. Arguably. Well, it's 1943. 1943. So, like, what else do you expect? That was yeah. when Blair came in and, like, actually made women in animation look good, so. <laughs> and the man from Montreal. Matt Brunet, also known as Animat. Hello, Cinema Royal Podcast! So, how we do it? Fire! Fire! For some reason, James, when you say that, you you sound more like Ponyo. It sounds more like you're saying Ponyo. <laughs> Ponyo loves Sasuke! <laughs> Ponyo wants him! <sighs> <laughs> so blame the chorus, folks. Makes people do crazy things. Do not say that nonsense, Broomhilda. Now eat your food. Huh? So this, so this episode is a very heartfelt kind of tribute because last That's month why we're all acting so serious. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. so serious. I, uh, we, uh, we uh, finally after a month later, we figure we pay tribute to the late, great uh, James Horner, the film composer, conductor, all that good jazz when it comes to music film music. Person. <laughs> music. He makes the music for the movies. He he writes the music and he conducts the music for the films. And he does not play the instrument, but he hires other people to do so. Yes, he, he did go da 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 in a nutshell, but... Uh... He wears the powdered wig and the tuxedo, I think, at least that's what the Bugs Bunny cartoons tell me. Oh, that's yeah. Leopold. Yeah. Le- Le- Leopold. So, so yeah, James Horner was was one of my all time. He he has been all, one of my all time favorite composers when it comes to film. So I say, what the hell is with the lack of parachutes? Right. I don't know what you're talking mm-hmm. about. You that, mean parachutes? There were no parachutes on that plane. I think uh, that's what oh. I read. Oh, oh, the, 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 yeah, okay. I was like, parachute. Like, oh, that's right. He died in a, in a plane crash. I didn't think we we're gonna talk in depth about it. No. But anyway, I just had to get that out of my system. Yes. Yeah, so we, we like to pay tribute by talking about four selective uh, films that he scored himself. Uh, should be interesting, actually. We never, we never normally do do not talk about music, and when it comes to film, uh, we haven't done that yet. So this could be a new experience for us, and I uh, hope you like it. And let's start off with his earliest, one of the earliest films he's done, and it's probably the film that made him mainstream for all of us, especially in the in- entertainment industry. And that's Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan. Well, you're half right there, Mike. This was definitely the film that put him into the public eye and made him the huge deal he is today. It's not his first ever film. And it's not the film that necessarily got him known to, like, the directors of Star Trek II. That would be, um, I don't know, The Lady in Red. Some Uh, movie that I'm not talking about, so I I don't remember the name. Well, the first one that he was credited was back in ninth. Like as a major conductor, I said would be either The the Hand, Wolfen, or or Deadly. I said one of the, I didn't say the first, I said one of the... I was trying to transition, Mike, into talking about some history, into details, and you just had to save your damn ego, didn't you? So anyways, about Star Trek Two. Yes. Yes. Go on. Yes. So, you're all familiar with the Star Trek franchise. I'm sure I don't need to go into detail talking about every movie, especially Star Trek Two. See, Star Trek Two is notably different from Star Trek 1 in that it had much more of a budget. And no, sort I'm of sorry, a story. I, I have that wrong. It, it had less of a, du- a budget. Because, you know, it, w- it was some ways past the show, and it was a different time in terms of Star Trek lore. The point is, they couldn't get Jerry Goldsmith, who was another famous composer that I'm sure most of you are aware of. He did the music for the first movie, and they wanted him mm-hmm. for the second movie, but they couldn't get him. So... They decided to get somebody else, and they wanted to get somebody who they thought would put the music in a different direction. Someone who had experience, but wasn't like every 
composer who was making music at the time, like Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams and stuff. Right. So, they called in the young at the time composer, James Horner. Mm-hmm. After reading his demo tapes and seeing the very few films that he did, making this one of the first, Mike, thank you very much. And the film was so massively successful that even when the movies got more of a budget, they kept him on for at least one other film. And then Star Trek Four went off and I don't even know. That's not the movie I'm paid to talk about in Souls. If you uh, have the... Well, I have the uh, Star Trek box set, which has Star Trek 1 through 6. Uh, if you have the Star Trek 2, the Wrath of Khan DVD, which I have, there's actually a featurette all about James Horner. No kidding. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's James Horner uh, composing Genesis. So, it's actually pretty interesting. Genesis? Anyway, Star Trek 2. It's known for having some of the best music in Star Trek. Music that would carry on throughout most of the other movies movies, including the main theme, a.k.a. Kirk's theme, a.k.a. a remix of the theme from the TV show, which was used in the opening. You know, the do 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 mm-hmm. Also very famous is the um, con theme, a.k.a. the ship fighting theme, a.k.a. the music from the scene where the ship was attacking the other ship. You know, the do 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 Mhm. Mhm. Yeah, my 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 thesis uh, with, and this is going to be with, with most composers or most good ones out there, uh, especially in the case of James Horner, is that a third, at least a third of the time, if you're listening to a a film that is scored by James Horner, a a third of your enjoyment is just the damn music. One of the things about James Horner's style is that he does a more modern, for the time, take on it while also mixing in some classic stuff. So there was a little bit of the elements of Jerry Goldsmith and John Williams in there, but it was also very much his own thing. Like, he he made music that was, like, evocative of, like, you know, pirate stories and a lot of classical music, a lot of bombastic elements. What the? Tuesday? What? I think I pretty much said all that needs to be said. I mean, I could talk about the movie itself, but I feel like that would distract somewhat from the... And that's the thing about this episode, is it's a little different, because we're not talking about just the film, we're talking about the music that drives, you know, and moves the film. We're talking about an element from a movie instead of the full movie itself. Exactly. It's like how... I love the music that plays when Spock dies, and the Ama- Amazing Grace song, that was powerful. Yeah. That was, yeah, that, I think that was definitely the biggest highlight in uh, Star Trek Two in terms yes. of the soundtrack, is definitely the Amazing Grace soundtrack. But I don't uh, want to say that it's James Horner's highlight, because he didn't technically make that melody. No. He did make the melody for, like, he most made of a very memorable. He made possibly one of the most memorable uh, renditions of Amazing Grace. I think that's the best way to put it. Although yeah, because it, was... it starts off with a bagpipe, and then it... Uh... The bagpipe is center, central, and then uh, it just jo- they Jeez. just join in with the whole chorus and everything. Jeez. This thing makes noise. Yeah, it goes click, click. No, it doesn't. Hold on. Maybe you need to get a new one. Did you hear that? It makes noise. See? I'm not crazy, you guys. Okay. 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 Well, crazy enough to interrupt this whole thing to show that it makes noise. <laughs> Star Trek to keep you guys updated. The Wrath Con has the most beautiful music. I mean, it gives you... It gives... When you watch the film, it moves you. Like, you get invested in the film more. Like, when Spock dies, you feel that sadness. You know, the music just tears your emotion into which should be the goal of all all movie soundtracks you know increasing the emotional investment Mm -hmm. 
and that's what it, and James Horner does this, like, orchestrated kind of score where it's just, like, so beautiful to listen to, you know, just kind of relaxing sometimes. Sometimes it gets intense when it comes to that battle, that fight with Khan and Kirk, and it goes all over the place, which is good. It, goes, it has highs and lows and highs and lows, like a roller coaster, and it's just it's great to listen to. Yeah, the yeah, hearing his his take on the you, you call it a, a remix, but it's it's more of a I, I guess you could call it that. Hearing his take on the classic Star Trek theme is probably what has has kept it afloat. What has kept it contemporary? I mean. Um, I, to be honest with you, I, I remember the, the TV show, I remember the TV show uh, from when I watched it as a kid. I haven't watched it recently, but I guess I was uh, I was a little bit more of uh, next generation era. Okay. Anyway, um, had it not been for the Star Trek movies, I probably would never be familiar with uh, the original series theme, which I can't even remember from the original show. Like, that? are you sure that was the same theme? <laughs> it probably was. It was a same theme. Not necessarily the same as, like, the opening, but it was definitely a common lead motif. A similar theme. Mm-hmm. Ah. Uh, a motif. You know your music... You you know little know your music terminology. A leet motif. A leet motif. Which usually describes the music specifically for a character or a plot device. Mm-hmm. Ah. Like Khan's leet motif. The do 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 do. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah. What what instrument? Uh, what instruments do you mostly recognize? Uh, in the score? A uh, lot of... Not trumpets. They're not trumpets, but there there is some kind of brass instrument in there. I think there's, like... Horns? Bull... Not bull horns. Well, okay, I know musical movie terminology, not instruments. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. There's, lot, there's definitely drums. Yeah, yeah, lots, lots of. It's interesting. It, it's hard to, you know, when you're think and do like research or you're thinking about watching a movie with a composer in mind. It's kind of hard. You try to listen to the music in the background more than watching the actual film, and it's interesting to actually just like close your eyes and just listen to the music instead of watching the film. Yeah, I love the music tell the story, which honestly, that's the way it should be. A lot of the time, yeah. I noticed that. Uh, I noticed that with James Horner's scores, he likes to have a. He likes to. He likes to play around with the brass section quite a lot, at least. Uh, at least to lead, the scores. I guess that's why they call him James Horner. But. <laughs> Do Again, very John Williams, because Lord knows John Williams loves his trumpets. Oh yeah, yeah. He... Uh, well, we'll get to him another time. Yeah, we'll we'll uh, get into other composers in we'll the near future. We'll see how this one goes uh, until like we can go to other composers. Yes, yes. You, the viewers at home, tell us is this a good episode so far? Till the end, comment below saying you want more of those these episodes. And by the way, yeah, I don't know. But Jada keeps interrupting with her interruptions. <laughs> interruptions. Interrupt I'm not you. trying to be a distraction. I hope you guys will go on without me. I'm just I'm trying to keep focused. Oh, good. No, okay. it's not your it's fault. Okay. Jay, don't no, it's, it's fine. I'm just, we're just picking on you. It's okay. If you li if you like uh, composer-based episodes, uh, pick out the time code at which I'm saying this right now. Write it in the comment section and say, I like composer-based episodes. Please do more. Thank you. Thank you. Please do that if you're listening to this part. Uh, by the way, if you were listening to this episode and watching it, I will have the playlist of his soundtrack, so you can listen to the soundtrack as we talk about these films. Just a little side note. 
Anyways, mm-hmm. anyways, re- it's it's really hard to talk about music when it comes to films. I mean, what else do you talk about? I mean, sure, you talk about the instruments that's he uses in the score. You talk uh, about the moods, and you talk about the highlights, and you talk about the its place in James Horner's career history, of course. Obviously. What, yeah. How like how do how does it make you feel? at this moment or when you hear music that play that comes out like this or what, you can talk about what... things like the style and the inspiration no, no not style that's not the word i meant i meant genre yeah and what sensations what hot flashes do you get when you uh when you listen to this music yes yes um Rathacon just gives you all kind of moods you can feel happy sad kind of adrenaline pump where it comes to the battling music it's all over the place which should you know you should be at the edge of the seat because of the music in general mm-hmm. it's not something it's honestly I haven't like sought out to actually listen to the score alone by itself but it's something I could, could just consider doing like one day just to see if I could just imagine the movie in my head as I'm listening to it. I remember with, um, um, I, I believe there was a, a posting floating around Facebook, uh, and I guess this could be a, a, a side note, which, um, uh, since, you know, talking about Star Trek, uh, someone brought up a scene from oh, Star Trek 3, The Search for Spock, the scene in which um, uh, Kirk steals a spaceship to go to go out to the back to the Genesis planet uh, for lack of better terminology and even though it's and the soundtrack the score is just blasting amazingness all over the place mm-hmm. trying to sell you on the epicness of this of this one particular uh, spaceship theft and uh, it really enhances the experience just uh, it, it ups I should say it, it ups the suspense with a, with a little dash of fantasy on the side Yes. Yeah, it's a good way to describe it. I mean, of course, you know, we discussed our track in the past, and it's people, you know, it's not everybody's thing. So if you like Star Trek and haven't seen Wrath of Khan for God knows what reason, but if you're into the mood of actually looking up James Horner's stuff, you know, listening to the soundtrack or actually watching the movie to see how the music plays out, Rathacon is actually a good choice for you to check out. It's actually one of the most memorable soundtracks that he has uh, ever done. Hmm. <gasps> eh, quite possibly. Wait, one of. One of. Definitely one of. One of. The keyword is mm-hmm. one of. Mm-hmm. That's going to be today's word of the day. Today's word of the day, one of. One of. As opposed to quote of the day, we have word of the day now. It's words. One of, two words. Oh, yeah. That's true. <laughs> uh, quote of the day. Anyways, my film is totally obscure compared to everyone else's. Because when uh, I saw. Search... Par for the course for Mike Mixtape Janik. Hey, yours is not obscure. Come on. <laughs> Out of it's not something that's hard to find. It's not hard to well, okay. That's I mean, that's a good <laughs> thing, but it's just I suppose yeah. I guess not. I just if went... I if I had to say it, yours is a little bit more the oddball curious choice. Here, that's yeah. That, that's what I meant to say. The oddball curiosity because of the curiosity of me it was like, okay, James Horner. What should I look up? But no way. No, I have to. Oh, oh, this is good. So, mine is from 1985, 30 years ago, is Commando, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
Oh yeah, that's such an obscure movie, Mike. Really? Nobody's heard of that. Commando. I mean, what kind of... What's that? Oh. Who's Arnold Schwarzenegger? What is this, <laughs> from China? Mike, get back into Hollywood mainstream. You're confusing everyone. Is there any ma is there any, even any popular quotes in uh, Commando? I can't even think of one. I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember finish. anything but from it. Certainly hasn't impacted our culture. Let up some Steve Bennett. <laughs> remember, remember when I told you I killed you last? Yes, yes, yes. I lied. <laughs> All right, so I guess now I just thought it was just for me at least. It was like, wait, James Horner scored this? I mean, it's the most contemporary soundtrack of all of his uh, film scores. I mean, it's more got a, like an '80s motif to it. It's got like. Uh, instruments involved would have to be like a synthesizer, the steel drums, you know, saxophone here and there. It's like very contemporary 80s soundtrack. I'm sure there's like a couple of moments where it's the orchestrated fair that James Horner is known for. Um, but otherwise, it's a straight up loud and in your face kind of uh, 80s soundtrack. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's It pumps you up. It, it, it just depending on what the song is and I, I, I as I was watching the film I was kind of bopping along to it like the the drums were then they were like pretty badass so like go doom 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 doo -doo 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 -doo. it was like oh my god the synthesizer go do 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 it was like very intense when it needs to be intense sure I guess the score in certain scenes were not supposed to be necessary like there's a scene in the mall and they're just walking by just just walking, and there's like intense music. Do 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 do. It was like, could you just just calm down? Like, it's, nothing's happening yet. Then there's no action. There's just people walking. <laughs> it's um. It's yeah, just... it's at it's at that moment where the the score is actually just sort of um very minimal. Is the is the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. And. When you're when you're dealing with a film like Commando, that's I, I guess after I guess after other films like Terminator, people would sort of expect that with an Arnold Schwarzenegger film, the uh, the the scores match that type that same type of mood. I'd, I'd say this is more John Carpenter than it would be. Yes. James Horner. Yes, yeah. I was just thinking about that. I was like, that's another example of James... Hey, John, hey John Carpenter, yeah, yeah. It was like something dark and something ominous. and. Well, like... one of James Horner's strongest traits is that he's got a lot of variety to him. You know, like, he's not necessarily tied down to a specific style in the same yes, way that, like, exactly. Hans Zimmer or Danny Elfman are. He's, right. he's delved into, like, so many different genres, and he's made a lot of tracks that you wouldn't know were by the same guy. Exactly. Which is a rare thing. That is, and it's I, that, that, that's variety for me. I was just like, what is this? I love this. It's just like... No disrespect I, to Danny Elfman or anything. I know I there know. are people that are hard on him. I'm not one of them. I love Danny Elfman. I'm just yeah, saying. He's, yeah, he's just, particular. Yeah. he. It's very different. And, and honestly, as I was researching for this episode, like I, I was listening to the soundtrack more. Like I was listening to the individual tracks more. Like... I was listening to the, uh, I'll link it below, but there's a uh, extended uh, soundtrack that was released a few years ago, and it has 24 tracks, because um, the original soundtrack has 8 tracks, so this is extended soundtrack has like a lot more from the film, and you hear all the cues and all the instruments, and there's a, like, three of the songs are like alternate versions of the songs that are in the film, so it's kind of cool listening to the variety of Horner scores he did for the film. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, um... It's... Honestly, Schwarzenegger's, like... One of the best ones I've seen, actually. And the music kind of does get you in the mood for this hardcore action. Non-stop, you know... Trip where Schwarzenegger has to find his daughter. And he's like, oh yeah, you do that. Best Schwarzenegger movies or best Schwarzenegger movie soundtracks? Uh, well, that's a good question. 
Because I, I don't I, think you can top Conan. Like, I love James Horner, but let's be honest here for, like, just a second. Oh my Talk god, Conan. Conan. Come on. <laughs> Conan. Yeah. That was a badass soundtrack. I was referring oh, to... Yeah. I was referring oh, okay. to soundtrack, yeah. I was referring to the film, not the soundtrack. But I need to listen to more Arnold Schwarzenegger film soundtracks then to compare. But otherwise, yeah. it was yeah, like it's one of my favorite Schwarzenegger films. And that soundtrack was like, damn, put that in my favorite '80s soundtrack movies. So, yeah, I I had the the pleasure of crash watching it last night uh, with the mic here and the the only time that I personally think that it feels it actually starts to feel like a, a James Horner James Horner score is the the moment where um, they, they have a scene early on in the film that that just shows uh, Arnold with his Arnold's character, John Matrix, uh, with his daughter, played by Alyssa Milano, who's like, what, 12 in this movie? Something like that. And, uh, yeah, the the synthesizer score takes a back seat, kind of, sort of. Uh, it, it feels less electric, and they start playing with the strings, the string section a little bit more. And in that sense, it starts to become... It's got this sort of uh, classical feel. It it almost it almost starts to feel like a Disney movie, the way that the the music is coming in, because you know you've got these these happy scenes with father and daughter uh, chopping wood together and learning how to fight together. Yeah, and, you it's know. the opening credits, by the way, if you're wondering. <laughs> yeah, but oh, of course that's not the entire soundtrack. The uh, the rest of the film the rest of the film is something different we even we even picked apart a part of a section of, of it with uh, a saxophone <laughs> section yeah a and, section and, of it with a saxophone section blah, 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 blah. there was I a had talk backwards i get merge witched up <laughs> um yeah there was a tune where it had like saxophone and I was like ooh that's good I'm is dyslexic uh, but um, yeah the, the saxophone doesn't sound it, it sounds it, it solidifies this as an as an 80s thing because you notice yeah uh, those, with those... sitcoms and whatnot they always had the saxophones coming in in the in the Very introductions 80s. and everything that's yeah, Very it was like kind of a weapon yeah, it was like mm-hmm. trope in the '80s where the the sax was just all over the place and just it was all very saxy. God, there was so much sax and Lethal Weapon. Oh yeah. Sorry, yeah. just just. It's okay. I don't know who did the soundtrack for that movie, but it was somebody saxophone. It was the it '80s. Was a Everyone was having. It it was it was the '80s. Everyone was having sax, and then AIDS happened. So. <laughs> like scenes where nothing was happening had sax scenes that were like supposed to be really serious had saxophone it was just okay never mind never mind it doesn't matter yeah so... apologies to all uh, to all eight personages out there jeez um but yeah I just wanted James to be on my side and be like hey they can watch watch this with me and see what you think and so I'm not the only one talking about it, because it's, well, it's something you have to witness for yourself when it comes to the visuals and the music. But, of course, if you're listening to it on, on your own, it's actually something you could put on your like iPod or something. depends on the track. Because mm-hmm. well, there's, a, there's a lot of... The things I noticed was, of course, like I said, it was a synthesizer, because all, all the things in the 80s are all like synthesizer music and... Um, like I said, saxophone was one of them, but the main one I heard a lot was steel drums. The oh, steel yes. drum, that steel drum just pops up at every track, like do, 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 do. it's like a like a Jamaican came in there to do uh, a steel drum. Ah, oh, crap! Yeah. We lost our drummer. Hold on, I got this man. 
that became cool in no time. Wait, uh, this is an action movie. You realize that? Can you can you do that with a steel drum? Oh, it's don't like... worry, man. I can do it. <laughs> this steel drum, it makes magic. It doesn't make sound. It's all about the You just and sit back it... and enjoy the action that is the steel drum. And at the end of the day, the director put the music together, and he was like, Damn, that is one action-packed steel drum. <laughs> I mean, it's like one of the things I noticed. I was like, oh, steel drums, something different. And I, and I appreciate the variety. I mean, it's just, It's not wow. like you'll do it else. You don't. Unless you find a film that has steel drums in it, you're, you're not going to find a soundtrack with steel drums in it. No, 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 no. It's not every day that you hear steel drums for action. Yes. Yes. Yeah, for action films. I mean... I just saved you a lot of comments of people going, Well, they used it in those holiday movies, you know, when they're on vacation, relaxing by the beach, you're like... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saving my ass. Indeed. In case you were... Oh, of course, in case you're wondering, for the Lethal Weapon soundtrack, there was three people who composed the music. Is that for all the movies, or just the first one? Just the first one. Because all the movies had an abundance of horn, saxophone, stuff. Yeah. But, um, yeah, if you haven't seen Commando, which you should, it's one of the ultimate Arnold Schwarzenegger films. It's got classy one-liners, but this, the soundtrack is something you should just witness for yourself. Mm-hmm. Especially if you're in the 80s, like I am. Uh, yes. Speaking of 80s... Speaking of the, 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 the last 80s film in this section, from 1988. The animated film, of course, because Animat's talking about it. By Don Bluth. Came out the same weekend as Oliver and Company. Poor Oliver and Company. I think on the same Didn't week. Didn't even have a chance. Did Same not day. have a goddamn actually, chance. Well, actually, they were they were pretty equal. I know I don't mean the movies themselves, but like Land Before Time ended up winning, but it's like they were pretty equal. Oliver like, and Company is not known for being like a box office success for Disney. That's why Disney didn't put it in any of the Kingdom Hearts games. No, they didn't put it in the the Kingdom Hearts games because it's not a fantasy like Kingdom Hearts. Well, I mean at that or, or, I mean, or Tarzan. I mean, when it comes, well, I just want to say that for Kingdom Hearts, you never know what they'll put up. I mean, if they can put up Chicken Little, they'll put up anything. Yeah, they they did put up Chicken Little. Exactly. Okay. That did happen. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways, um, Land Before Time. Actually, before we begin with the Land Before Time, I just want to mention that with James Horner, um, he is not very well known for composing a lot of animated features, unfortunately, which would have been very amazing. Uh, the only times when he would ever compose for an animated feature would be anything involved with Steven Spielberg. Uh, the first one that he has done was uh, An American Tale and mm-hmm. The Lamb for Time, and then afterwards he would uh, compose the movies for Amblimation, which was Steven Spielberg's an- animation studio for mm-hmm. An American Tale, Five Will Goes West, We're Back a Dinosaur Story, and finally Balto. Right. But out of all those fil- out of all those animated films that he has ever done, um, especially for an animated feature, never has a soundtrack or a musical score has had so much of a major impact more than Land Before Time. Mm-hmm. Be- because for me, like with James Horner, whenever I would think of a soundtrack for him, um, like I knew I had to talk about the Land Before Time. Like I said before, like. Never has there been a movie where I feel so much impact coming from the soundtrack. It's like it's a true enhancer of um, what it, it's a true enhancer to the movie experience because he really does uh, pack so much emotion to it. And like even when I did um, when I was working on an animation, look back Don Bluth. Uh, most of the soundtrack when I would talk about the history of uh, Don Bluth. And, hit, and the studios he would work in, most of the stuff I would use is just The Land Before Time. They were really that good. Um, 
And pretty much he would, like for Lamp for Time, he would really emphasize the mood of what would go on. Um, most of the time he would settle for something calming and wi and uh, a bit whimsical in a sense because we are seeing it in the perspective of like technically young kids like basically um kids who just got who who just hatched out of their eggs and now exploring the world and even like throughout the whole movie they got to explore the whole world like they're, they're pretty much on their own on this great big journey for um the, the great valley so of course Matt. they have uh, yes. Why are they technically kids? Yeah, Aren't they literally just... kids? Like that's so weird to me. Like technically, since they are, you know, well, they... young creatures, they are kids. Well, I mean, like... In case you well, did I not mean, know, like, technically, if we split hairs kids. about it, well, like, they count. I just hatched out of the I hatched out of the eggs. You know what I mean. Uh... Just a footnote for those listeners out there who are not familiar with Land Before Times, the kids he's talking about are actually dinosaurs. That explains why they hatch out of their eggs, not like human children. Unless why you live in a giant chocolate egg and you have chocolate fever. Like, this is an animated movie, Matt. The dinosaur kids <laughs> kids. Like, we're not going to be like, we're not kids, they're dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Wow. Anyways. Um... Yeah, but definitely, it's not just. But it's not just for the calming, whimsical moments. There are definitely plenty of other times that really had a major impact. Like the intensity really is strong in the score. Whenever a sharp tooth would come in and just um, would go after Littlefoot and the gang, um, and for me, what two of the most memorable soundtracks in there? The two musical pieces. One is called Whispering Wind. This was played. Uh, during the scene when Littlefoot's mother dies and because of the soundtrack and the pacing and stuff like that uh, it, sounds, it could be controversial for me to say but the musical plays a major part on why that is possibly the most one of the most saddest moments in animation history even more than the death of Bambi's mother I don't it, know. It's, it has that much of an impact and that much of like, like the feels, you know, like it's so like how it really makes it so sad. And it definitely oh, yeah. is one of the saddest musical scores that you can hear. Like, like you you will listen to this and you will cry. And another one that really is the one of the most memorable scores that he has ever done for the Land Before Time was the discovery of the of the Great Valley. The moment when like. Like, he knows exactly how to pace it in, like, into something amazing. Like, like the build-up that would lead to Littlefoot, like, following to the scene, and then finally, like, he sees it, the great, like, the unveiling of the Great Valley makes it one of the most spectacular things ever. And the music really emphasizes it so well. It's like, you will remember this score. It's like, it's, it's the kind of thing, like, when you open, like you open your eyes and you see something majestic, it's it definitely has that feeling. It's just mm -hmm. amazing. Like, like you definitely feel like Littlefoot and the gang, like when they discover the Fairy Valley, like oh my God, here it is, and it's like this heavenly wonderland. So yeah, that's basically what I want to say about the score for the Lamb Before Time. It's just. It's it's a beautiful piece, one of the most memorable scores in an animated feature. It's I just, just oh, yeah. amazingly good. I just I, don't I, know. I, I mean, not. well, okay, I love Land Before Time, but when I think about Land Before Time, the things that I find memorable are the characters and the story and the animation. Well, Honestly, I don't remember. I don't remember much of the soundtrack at all, other than the Diana Ross song in the end, and you know that was Diana Ross. So oh. the soundtrack, I mean, it, it had like some nice pan flute stuff and it had some atmosphere, but there was nothing that was like particularly mind grabbing to me. There was nothing that was particularly original or stand outish. Everything I... just sort of blended into the scenes and the atmosphere, which is which is in its can in itself be considered a good thing. Well, I mean, I... that's the point of a score. Though. I definitely remember more of the score from American Tale, but that's par partly because it has songs in it, so. Uh, that's yeah. Well, yeah. The, 
Amer American Tale is also an excellent score, uh, but I always think with The Land Before Time, maybe it was because I watched it religiously, but I, 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 I'll have to actually, I'm afraid I'm going to have to side with Matt on this one. I, I remember there is, there's one scene in the film that now that I, now that, you know, looking back on it and everything, uh, he, uh, there's a, a scene shortly after the death of Littlefoot's mother, uh, where we, where we are treated to, uh, a, a bunch of baby pterodactyls, uh, fighting over a, fighting over a cherry. That scene is so cute. Yes. Yes. You, you remember that now? Yes, so I cute. remember. Little well, baby pterodactyls in their little cherry. And he's like, oh, little foot's sad. Here, little foot, have a cherry. Oh, he doesn't want the cherry. Now the baby pterodactyl's sad. It was so cute. It, it was an it was a nice scene, and I and I kind of realized, thinking maybe this is a maybe this was put in there uh, to to sort of counter counterbalance the uh, uh, the, the any heavy, possible the emotional death. Yeah, the any possible emotional damage that. Uh, kids watching this may have just gone through. Possible, and yes. dude? Possible? Are you sure about that? <laughs> and yes. Oh, that's a guarantee. And yes. And... I cried. Yes. I we cried. We all did. Oh, we God. all did. But there's... Oh, I still cry. If I watch the movie, like, right now, I'll still cry. Don't even matter. Oh. Uh, let's all watch it together later and just, you know, have a good cry over it. Um... So, yeah, and and I remember the the score during this part. There's a there's a little flute that uh, that that takes over when the baby pterodactyls are fighting over each other, and it this, and it it just sort of does a. Uh, I can't exactly hit the notes, but if you if you listen to the that particular score sample, you'll you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, personally, my favorite, my, my favorite selection of the score altogether was, uh, the crit was, uh, the, the instrumental suite that you can watch during the credits. And because there is a moment, uh, I, I think that this this uh instrumental suite uh it it sums up the feeling of the of the film altogether very very well it starts out with a a string section going and i'm just like sitting there just thinking now how are they playing that how are they playing that because you know the it, these are strings you know these are violins and instruments that you rub stuff across so it's like what 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 manner of magic are you are you doing and the horn comes in and goes and it it feels like it it feels like there is there is miracles happening and i always uh, this this piece this piece of the soundtrack, which was repeated throughout the film, along with um, when we go on together, it, or if we hold on together, um, I actually I actually ended up uh, recycling that score myself in a uh, one of my earliest edited videos. Uh, there was a home movie I made over 10 years ago where my family, where I recorded my family going down to Louisiana for uh, a trip that we used to take down there. We had a, we have a farm down there, and one thing we used to do as a family was make cane syrup oh. as a family tradition. And uh, since I was just getting into editing and whatnot, I decided to videotape everything, take it home, and then make it an experience. And there's one section in there where I've got, I've got the cane syrup bubbling up, and everyone's around there. And I thought, you know what would go nice right here? 
It, it's a very festive score. Only now whenever I hear it, I can't stop but... I can't help but stop and think about syrup. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> well, every... Every time I hear the score to this movie in particular now, I, I get this <laughs> feeling of syrup, and I really like it. I want to go to Denny's and drink the... and take a drink out of the pitchers. God. Um, but that with this film, there there was a... I think there were some, some trends. Maybe they were... Maybe they were trends that um, showed up earlier. I just can't recall them all out right off the bat. Okay, okay. For American Tale, they they did uh, he did repeat somewhere out there throughout the score. Mm-hmm. Um, it was the score at the opening. The, you know the do 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 do, which I thought was really quite nice. Yeah. They played yeah. that in a lot of the sad scenes. Well, yeah. See, Land for Time had one crying scene. American Tale had like ten. That movie is exhausting, oh. man. Yeah. Although the, there are some scenes that they don't need it really. It's just a sad scene, just for the sake of having a sad scene. Because they need to dehydrate us. That's their evil plan, so that we <laughs> die of crying, literally. And and, and there are some move. and there are some trends in here that I I noticed in later James Horner scores. I'm just going to make this sort of a footnote here because I know we have so much time. Uh, I was listening to the Casper score last year. I got my hands on that and there, it's hard to describe but um, there are moments in there where it, it sort of resembles it sort of resembles Land Before Time just a little bit in the, in the way that it's tackling the whimsy angle. Is this the, the Casper movie? Yeah, Casper 1995, James Horner also scored that, fun fact. What? <laughs> huh. And then... I do not remember and, that movie's music at all. Like, at and all. And then... And then later on, when he scored Ron Howard's How the Grinch Sold Christmas, um, there were... There are moments in there, because I, because I did it from pages to pictures on this last year. I was listening to that soundtrack the whole way through, and uh, uh, the song from the film "Where Are You, Christmas," which I don't think is particularly all that memorable, is repeated throughout the score. Only when it does that, it they have a chorus singing it going. They really wanted a song to chart from that movie, James. Like, you don't understand. They were desperate. Desperate for their song to chart. And it did, so they were happy. And, uh, hey, they succeeded on their mission. They did, and now we'll never, ever, ever stop hearing it every goddamn year. (laughs) Thanks. And... and, and that brings me back to the land before time when you what was the scene you were what was the the track number again whispering winds yeah number three i believe oh no 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 that's the discovery of the great valley actually that is yeah because um yeah that that's the build-up like that's the build-up to the great valley whispering winds is the sad one Oh, oh! Now I know what you're talking about. Ooh. Like, okay. which, by the way, Whispering Winds also has a build-up at the beginning. Like, like before going to, if we hold on together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, like I said, Jane. That's uh, another trend of James Horner is right there, the uh, the repeated, or as you as uh, Jada so notably pointed out, the lead motifs. Thank you very much. We all learned something new today. Yeah. Why is I like using it. I like appreciating lead motifs. 
because they can help shape a character. Mm-hmm. Qu question, why is Land Before Time not on Blu-ray, but I can, I can apparently check out episodes of the darn TV show that they made in HD on, uh, on Amazon? <laughs> Good thing. Amazon Good question. is a lot less picky than Blu-ray is. I don't know. Univer yeah. Universal, why aren't you doing anything? Like, seriously, yeah, why not, like, what's the, what's with the delay on Land Before... Where's an American Tale and Land Before Time Blu-rays? Seriously. My question is why Netflix has, like, half of the Land Before Time sequels, but I can't get the original. Ah, ah, I have answered oh. your question. Wait, wait, James. James, what? I got an answer to your question. October 13th, 2015, DVD and Blu-ray plus digital HD for Land Before Time. <laughs> yes! So, any, bo any bonus, interesting bonus features or stuff like that? I do not have any other descriptions besides that. I just have the release date. So there you go. Yes. That, put that on your wish list for Christmas. Yes, people at home, if you want Land Before Time on Blu-ray and or DVD, it's coming in October. In English, Portuguese, and Danish. Okay. Thank you, Blu-ray.com. Yes, Blu-ray.com. Uh, All the needs for Blu-ray editions. Mm -hmm. See, there you go. You're, there's your answer. To your question. All right. I, for one... I don't really remember it. It's weird. I, I, it was a film that I did grow up on. Like, I was like five or ten years old. I remember watching the film. I just don't remember the cue. I, I had to revisit it sometime because I have not revisited it since I was ten or at least ten years old. So, doesn't. Well, there you go. We all need to do a watch it and do a commentary. There we go. That'll go great alongside our Albert. Oliver and Company commentary too. Side yeah, side. coming October thirteenth. I'm announcing it right now. We will do okay. the Land Before Time. Before time kind of... yes. I'll say this: Land Before Time had Diana Ross, but Oliver and Company had Billy Joel. I know. And Bette Midler. Yep. Ooh. I know. That's not good. Mm -hmm. One minute I'm in Central Park, and I am a Central Street. And I'm down on Delancey Street, from the Bowery to St. Mark's, there's a syncopated beat. That's how you do it. What should I care? This song's gonna be in my head all goddamn week now. It is, it's a catchy song. I've been how listening... such a forgettable movie have such a memorable goddamn song? Yes! Oh my god. That's the case with plenty of, move... plenty of movies, actually. So like the only song I remember for, I don't even remember the Bette Midler song I know there was one but I don't remember it there is, yeah, I just there's... remember that one song yeah <sighs> favorite mm -hmm. song ever anyways let's round it off with the last film on our little checklist Is uh, 20 years ago was Braveheart Braveheart oh. no wait that's Brave Star never mind <laughs> nice Yes, James. Do, 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 do. Ropes. Okay. Wrong James, score. do tell. Do tell about this Braveheart, this epic tale of Braveheart, and how the score impacted it, and All how right. Bolshevik it is. Okay. <laughs> I will tell. Um, I'm going to tell you this. Braveheart. Uh, who who here has seen the film? Okay, Matt. It's like yeah. five hours long, well, you guys. It's a better thing to do with my time. It's like it's a long movie. Yeah, it's I don't a, even like no sin. You're lucky I sat through Lethal Weapon and Lethal Weapon Two, which was better, by the way. Oh, good, good to know. Anyways. Well, well, let's see. Uh, to to sum things up, the story of this film, it it tells the tale of William Wallace. Uh. A, a Scotsman who uh, led ar led the uh, armies led a led a war against the against the uh, British occupiers in the 13th century. It was a war between Wallace, uh, Robert the Bruce, and uh, uh, 
King Longshanks at the time. <laughs> Longshanks. It sounds such nature. And fa fancy enough, that's about all this movie got right. The rest, the vast majority of this film, spoiler alert, is total bullshit. But there, there is a that that's where I think. Uh, usually, I'd be offended by this, because but... I I hate it when I hate it when uh, biographical movies, especially ones that uh, that were made, like in the twenty uh, regarding events in the twentieth century, try to romanticize way too much. And that's and that's because it always feels like someone someone has someone has an agenda behind it or they they want to give you they want to give you a lie to uh to make you feel better about something um with uh with the case of braveheart there is a perfectly good excuse for the reason it came out the way that it did and that <laughs> is the screenwriter um for this thing didn't have much to work with. There's realistically not a lot of his, uh, a lot of historical, factual information available about William Wallace, and at least uh, not during the time that he was writing it. This is this is the age of the internet. You can look this stuff up and find all kinds of historical resources and get your answers like that. But um, with the case of with the case of Braveheart, he actually decided to base a significant chunk of it on a poem that was written in the seventeenth century. And I don't know how well this this poem corresponds with the story that Braveheart tries to tell, but it it makes it, in my opinion, excusable. For for making for taking a, a, a historical event, which I watched in the history class the first time I saw this movie. It was a high school history class, but they they should have known they should have known that this was factually inaccurate. Um, they take a, a historical event and make it something something romanticized, something more than it is, more like a fairy tale. So, as long as you go into the movie feeling like you're going to watch a fairy tale, if you're in that kind of mood, then then this this movie will be most acceptable, I think. Well, I don't know about you, but I expected historical accuracy from the guy who starred in The Patriot. <laughs> and I am very disappointed. Oh yes, you. But there were historical records of a man being decapitated by a cannonball. Didn't you know that? That's like on every in every history book. That's the first thing they write about the American Revolution: a guy being decapitated by a cannonball. In fairness, America would remember that. Mm. But it would have seriously it, though. It would be like the 18th century YouTube video. <laughs> yes. Watch this guy get decapitated by a cannonball. Yeah. You're yeah, uh, this movie. Have its next. It was the start of America. We didn't have any landmarks to destroy yet. So we had to start removing heads. Um, yeah. Something. And that's that's what one. That's another terrific thing that uh, Braveheart does, which is uh, remove heads and disembowel different bodies. Um. But Not during the, though. huh? Not with cannonballs, though. Not with cannonballs. No, they did. They didn't have it invented at the time. That would be historically inaccurate, and that is not what we're about. So, moving, moving forward, um, the the score that James Horner lays on this thing, which rightfully he got nominated for, and I I'm surprised he didn't win. Who won? Uh, I can't remember. It was '95. He, he later went on to. He later oh, went on he to. He was win actually for... nominated for two during that time. Uh, funny enough. 
two uh, movies in a year. Yeah, he was nominated for Braveheart, and he was also nominated for Apollo 13, which... Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yes, best music. Uh, original... Oh, wait a minute, there are two. Oh, oh, for original dramatic score. Okay. Uh, wow, I didn't know that best music for comedy and best music for drama. But anyways, um, the winner was Il Postino, the postman. Never even heard of that. Uh. The postman. Ugh. You, you you see you see Hollywood. You need the. Uh, you you're you're not on the level with the rest of us apparently, but. Um, I mean, Oscars moving... don't necessarily guarantee immortality, so there you go. Yeah. So. Uh, as as far as the score goes, I I I noticed something. When, when reading about this, apparently, apparently during the 13th century, bagpipe. Uh, no, no, no. Back up, back up. Bag, uh, bagpipe that ass up. Uh, when, uh, when uh, researching this film, I realized something. Uh, kilts and face paint were not. Uh, were not fashionable in Scotland in the 13th century. According to what I read up on, those only came around 17th century. But it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like uh, cowboys and Indians. You know, they have to create an image. And what's one thing that people think of when they think of Scotland? They think of kilts. So they're going to think of Scotland. Scotsmen going into going into battle wearing their kilts on and waving their face paint and their swords and what and crying freedom. And when they're not and, and if they're not fighting, then they're playing the music for the bagpipes. Yes. So that's after, let's go ahead and have relax, a theme. And go relax, have a beer and play golf. And go knock a ball in a golfer hole. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we going to do for a theme song for Braveheart? We're going to have bagpipes. And by golly, gee, those bagpipes are going to save the movie. They're going to sell it in the first two to three minutes. They've got Man. glorious sweeping yes. shots. You see James Horner going, bagpipes, bagpipes everywhere. Man, James Horner really likes his bagpipes, doesn't he? I guess for this film. He's becoming not just and Star Trek, and Star oh, yeah. Trek Mike. Oh shit! It's like bagpipes are the thing he's known for now. Yes, yeah, so that's another instrument. Yeah, 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 yeah. Same corner. So, he has a bagpipe thing. So that's what that's what you hear in the in the start of the film with these glorious swiping sweeping shots of Scotland that are definitely taken by helicopters, but they didn't have those in the 13th century either. So, it's we don't talk magic. about that. It's magical. It's magical Scotland. So we fly over the mountain tops and we set the camera on this one glorious looking mountain and the first thing we hear is Great job, James. And it's it's like it's like an opera with instruments and the bagpipe is the tenor who is oh. having his solo right here Ooh. and it it is it, it is a, a, a thing that has to be seen to be believed and definitely those bagpipes, that very same melody and whatnot, they do show up later. They do show up. They do serve a purpose throughout the course of the film. Again, with the leap motifs. Thank you again for the terminology. Apparently, James is really fond of that word now. That's well, I was going to say repeated motifs, but um, um, leap motifs leap... tend to refer specifically to character. Yeah. Well, they that happens there too. There's um, uh, later on in the film, uh, early on in the film, I should say. There's a moment where 
um, William Wallace is at his father's funeral. Spoiler alert, he dies in a manner that wasn't historically accurate. Oh my gosh. But... Great Scott! But, um... He wasn't a great Scott if he died, though. At least I don't think. At least I don't think he was. Uh, it was historically accurate, but I don't know what happened on that battlefield. So I wasn't no one there, was there was taking notes. Don't you know, James? He got decapitated by a cannonball. <laughs> <laughs> that's what happened. They're feeding you lies. Well, that's what happened to his head then. No, but somehow his head kit became back attached to his body when he was dead. So how did they burn the body with the head attached? <laughs> anyway, the, at the Sorry. funeral, there's a moment there where I guess what's showing up is a bagpipe quartet. And they're playing... And a man who's taken care of William Wallace, I believe he's an uncle or something like that, he turns over and he says, this is a tradition. They're playing melodies from Scotland that were banned just like they did for your father's funeral before you before him yeah, and that you. gives this before we did your funeral yes and uh, that is the moment right there where you, you feel where the bagpipes are a little bit more epic than they were before uh, for lack of better terminology. So, yeah, they, they repeat, they repeat that, and there's another moment in the score where they're going, do 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 And that's just the strings going, but it's a nice, it's a, it's, it's a nice light, light motif, I shall say. It, it reappears again in a moment where where um, Wallace is a, a wee lad visiting his father's grave after the funeral. And there's a little girl that comes up and hands him some flowers. And guess what? That turned later on in life, that turns out to be his first wife. But at that moment when she's handing over the flowers, again you hear the strings going do 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 And so when you hear that, you know something is about to you you know that it's like you said, character development. I guess. It's I'd have to re to re look up the specific definition to know exactly what the rules are for something be being a leet motif or not. Now, as for the battle scenes, here's something else I find rather interesting. One minute. Wait, <clears throat> hmm? Talk quickly, James! Quickly! Okay, the way that the... Oh, one minute left. That, oh, crap. One minute left. Okay. The way that the, the score accommodates the battle scenes is it only sort of dips down and helps build up to the battle scene. But as soon as the battle scenes happen, there is no music whatsoever. It's just the, the glorious sound of battle and possibly Dolby digital sound. And uh, so, and that's that's where you have a that's where you have a, a score that's thankfully less than minimal and just just sort of uh, says a scene can carry itself this way. And I, that's that's all I really had to say in terms of the score, but it was a great job, and one of his finest. And three, two, one. Don't believe it, just watch. Don't believe it, just watch. Don't believe it, just watch. That is the episode. I'm gonna wrap things mm -hmm. up. Was that um, your definition of talking quickly, James? Yes. Okay. 
Should I have done yeah, like better? The song says, "Don't believe me, just watch." Mm -hmm. I'll prove it to you. Uh, just quick final thoughts. Um, I've not seen Braveheart yet. I've not heard of the score yet, so I definitely might check that out. Depends on how long of a night I'd be willing to watch the God for a second movie. I'm probably not gonna watch Braveheart, honestly. It, there's nothing about it that interests me. Well, you could just, or you just listen to the score by itself and see how it uh, works out. I could um, listen to the score. Lord knows right. I've listened to scores of movies I've either not liked or just not watched. So, okay, I wanted to clear some things up or add to, like, uh, <laughs> James, did you know that, um, okay, Braveheart's getting a sequel. No. Yes. A what? Through... How do you make a sequel to a movie that's based on a historical event? I, oh, as I was reading Rise of an Empire. Hold on. As I was reading about uh, Braveheart, I saw a little snippet about a sequel. Let me uh, get this on Wikipedia really quick here. Sequel. In May of 2015, emails from the Sony Entertainment executives that were exposed by WikiLeaks uh, revealed that a unofficial sequel to Braveheart, currently titled Lion Rampage, is in development. Um, what does it mean, unofficial? It, I, that's actually a really good question. Um, Rampage. Why is it? Why is it that I'm not really that phased out that an idea, really kind of that dumb, would come from Sony? Why would Sony want to put like investment into a Mel Gibson project in this day and age? Hey, if they so... can. Hey, if they invest a lot of money on several crappy Adam Sandler films, they can do anything. So no, but... it's very different, Matt. There is a different, especially, like, wow, really? You know Adam Sandler's Jewish, right? <laughs> Damn. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> awkward. That like... was awkward. Holy moly. <laughs> <laughs> you just, just look at your face like... Oh, shit, I just see that. <laughs> um, the sequel will focus on Robert the Bruce and events after Wallace's death. Ah, Under. so they're writing out Mel Gibson. Gonna replace him with Tom Hardy. Probably. Um, Tom Hiddleston is in Negotiate a Star in the film oh. as the Bruce. For fuck's sake, with the Australian people. Get someone Scottish! <laughs> Scottish! There's a lot of other casting news besides that, but I just thought that was interesting. It's like, wait, 20 years later they're gonna make a sequel? <laughs> Why are Australian people somehow replacement Scottish people? I don't understand. Maybe they do a good Scottish accent, I don't know. Um, I do want to mention that uh, James Horner did scores that are coming out uh, after his death now. Uh, films coming out this year include The 33, and actually coming out by the time you of this recording is so Southpaw. So if you want to hear James Horner's, one of the last things he wrote and scored was Southpaw. You can check it out in theaters right now and see how it turns out. Looks like a good movie. But here's the thing. It's not the last score that he has written and conducted for a film. He's got something in the works in 2017 called The Man Magnificent Seven. The Magnificent a remake? Seven. The remake of the remake of a 1960 western, and he, this is this is what I thought was interesting. It was like, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. He there's a score he written already for a future film. Oh, I Which heard about that. Also a rem that is true. Did did you did you hear about the story? Yeah, I've heard about it actually. Not too long ago, I think this, this week. It's something like that, cause uh, yeah, like uh, I heard they might do something with it. Are they actually gonna make a movie around it, or just just let me let me find uh, d d d the actual paragraph I was reading from. Um, so this is a remake of a remake. Brilliant. <laughs> Magnificent Seven is a remake in itself. It's what I was thinking. <laughs> Although for some reason I feel like this is the first time that happened. Hollywood, you need to oh, chill. Wait, no, Oh yeah, the thing. That's true. That's Chill the fuck out, Hollywood. It is not a remake of a remake. It is a single remake, Matt. That also had a 2011 movie. It was a prequel, not a remake. People need to stop with that shit. Ah, here it is. But it doesn't make it good. <clears throat> no, it just doesn't make it a remake. <laughs> Go on, Mike. It doesn't make any sense either. 
composer James Horner was pegged to write the film's score. In July 2015, this is this month, nearly a month after Horner's death, the director... Fakwa? F-U... K Fakua? Q oh, Fakua. Oh, Lord Farquaad. Yeah, go on. I know Fakua him. Fakua learned that the score was already had been written and Horner had planned it for a surprise. Well, I'm surprised. <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. He wrote this thing already as a surprise for the director. So that's this is, this is his last, last score he has ever written. So, like, what? And, is it, like, a, a birthday surprise? Like, happy it, birthday, here's a here's my rendition of the Magnificent Seven score? I, it, I have no idea what that would mean. I mean, I just thought... Wow. We're going to see a James Horner scored film in 2017. With for a film that hasn't even been filmed yet. It's uh it's filming right now actually as we uh speak in the, to this uh episode. So Yeah, but when so, it was done, it hasn't even been filmed yet. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's what I, that was the staggering I was like, wait a minute. How does James Horner write, uh write music for something that has not been produced yet or filmed yet? It's like did you watch the original and just like of the nineteen sixty one at least and just like oh I'll just just do like a remake of it like a cover of all the tunes or something I don't know I just, I just thought that was like interesting yeah what are they gonna do now when they edit the movie are they gonna are they gonna have to work backwards usually when you when you're scoring something you have to have a, a rough edit of the film to work with and a, and a, an an idea. But so, what are the, is the editor gonna listen to the score now that it's already finished and and try to edit the movie to the score? It's not unheard of. It's not ideal, but yeah, yeah. I just thought that was interesting. So it's not the last James Horner scored film besides Southpaw and the, and the 33 coming out this year. Um, but that leads up to the next episode of Cinema Royale, uh, Made of the Seven, coming on 2017 as a remake. And next time, in two weeks, we're going to do an episode all dedicated to remakes. Uh, comparing the original to the remake of these films, whatever we choose. Um, it's going to be a fun time. It's going to be a fun yeah. time. We, we also have a guest coming on for this episode, too. A good buddy of ours named Charles Thomas, also known as Duke CT, I believe. Yay. So it's going to be a fun little time talking about these remakes and comparing to the original and ripping a new one. <laughs> well, depending mm -hmm. on which ones, of course. Well, ripping, uh, ripping the bad ones a new one. There are good remakes. Yeah, there are. Yes. I was, I'm sure I was... somebody will talk about a good remake. Yeah. I'm not, but somebody yes. will. Yes. There will be discussions of a good remake. Yes. Um, but yes, until then, this has been Cinema Royale. And uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. And uh, good night. See you later, Good night, dudes. sweetheart.